everyone could make it today. We're super excited to welcome the incredible mastering engineer, Jessica Thompson. Um, before we jump in, just really quick, I just wanted to say that this is our um, the very first installment in a new lecture series that we are developing, um, that we're launching actually along with a new uh, degree program that we're calling Music and Technology. And basically this program will be aimed at students who are interested in pursuing careers in the music industry, whether it's um, as a songwriter, music producer, um, sound designer for film or, uh, or games or um, recording or audio engineer. Um, we'll be basically uh, having um, areas for um, a focus that students can choose. Um, anyway, we're very excited about launching this new program. We've been working hard on um, coming up with some new courses as well. So uh, please stay tuned for further developments and updates. Um, and so we're just, yeah, super excited to have you all here. Um, I keep saying we, so just uh, to point out who we have here, let's see, Chris Bobrowski, um, you know, also of course integral to the development of the music and technology program and the lead electronic music faculty here at CSM. Um, Chris, do you want to say anything? Hello. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> just, just hello. All right. I think many, most of you know Chris already. Um, and then Brenda Hutchinson is also here. Uh, Hi. Also our electronic music faculty. And um, let's see, I don't know if I see Donna yet, but Donna, um, I know many of you have come from Donna's class, um, who is our digital audio production, uh, our digital audio production uh, faculty. Um, anyway, we're super excited for you all to come. And I just yeah, wanted to turn it over, before I turn it over to Jessica real quick, I, you probably already saw, um, you know, read a little bit about her, but um, as you hopefully read, Jessica is a Grammy nominated mastering engineer who also specializes in um, audio restoration of historic recordings, which I think is another super fascinating area, which could probably be its own separate. We'll have to invite you again to talk about that <laughs> uh, separately. Um, but you can read more about her on her website, jessicathompsonaudio.com. And um, I've just always been really impressed by Jessica's work. I think um, it's really, you know, she does just because you've covered such a breadth of styles and different genres of music. Um, also just a lovely person and, and great teacher as well. So we're super lucky to have her here. Um, Jessica, just so you know, I think I mentioned to you, but we have students here from several different classes. We have um, my Electronic Music One class. Um, we also have Chris's um, sound creation, sampling and synthesis class, a portfolio class, and then um, some students here from digital audio production. So. There is a range of students here eager to hear from you. Um, before, a last quick note, um, just everyone, I think everyone's probably used to this by now, but just um, remember to stay muted during the presentation. But um, if you uh, have a question, feel free to add in the chat and I'm sure Jessica will yeah, build in probably some moments where we can ask questions and we'll def definitely has a, have a designated Q&A at the end. All right, I think that's it. Unless, yeah, Chris, I don't know if you have any other announcements. Um, oh, Nicolas, I need to mention Nicolas where I don't see you in the million squares, but <laughs> Nicolas Fernandez, of course, um, our wonderful instructional aid at um, DIGME and Electronic Music Instructional Aid, and we couldn't do it without you. So thank you so much. Who designed the flyer for us? Thank you. Right. Hello. Thanks, Nicolas. All right. Jessica, so glad to have you here. <laughs> I thank think you can take you. it away. <laughs> and thank you for mm -hmm. such a kind introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk to you today. Uh, I am a mastering engineer. And one of the best things about that is I get to work on a huge range of styles of music, genres, um, eras. I do a lot of work on historic recordings. So sometimes I might be working on something from the 1950s, and then I might be doing like an EDM track the next day, sometimes all in one day, you never know, you never know. Um, before we dive in, if this were a smaller room, I would love to do intros so I get to know you all a little better. But since we're a big room and I don't want to take up too much time with that, um, one of the most important parts of my job is critical listening. And I know you all do that in your other classes. So I would like to know from all of you what commercially released album you are listening to that you think sounds fantastic. And I want you to throw it on the chat. Because then I'm going to go back and look at it and make a playlist of the music that you all love and, and are inspired by and 
um, and aspire to, you know, emulate in your own creative work or at least admire, um, throw me some stuff in the chat. What are you listening to that you like? And I'll tell you one uh, crazy thing I've been listening to because I like to keep I like to keep up with the popular music. I think it's important to just know what's going on in popular music across all genres. So yes, I was listening to the new Adele record. And um, I, I got a little tip off about this because I have been working with the Errol Garner Jazz Project for the past, like, I don't know, five or 10 years on Errol Garner's archive. And Adele completely independently stumbled a plot across an Errol Garner track on YouTube and liked it and built a song around a sample from it and then worked with the Errol Garner Jazz Project to license that Errol Garner sample. So it is for me the craziest intersection of this historic work I've been doing in audio for 10 years and like Adele, the most A-list of A-list stars sampling. I had nothing to do with the Errol Garner recording. Like none of this has anything to do with me other than an incredible appreciation for the music of the past and the way it informs and intersects with the music that's being made today. Um, I'm super into all of these records. I see Aphex Twin and Prince, BTS. I love, I was a huge King Crimson fan growing up and Pink Boy too. I have a real soft spot for Prague. There's Adele and Black Pumas and like some people I haven't heard of. So I'm really excited to go through do a little more listening. Okay, today we're gonna to talk about mastering. I have a demo for you. I have some tracks that um, some of you have submitted that we can workshop and listen to and talk about. And if we have time, I can also go in uh, a bit to restoration work. The restoration work, uh, work that I do is typically on historic recordings that are badly damaged or have aged very poorly and just need a lot of work but I use those same tools and those same skills on basically every project that comes through my studio. So the, the skills that you get from studying how to do restoration, they will take you many, many places. They are incredibly valuable. And I also made slides because I love teaching. So uh, here we go with the slides. There's a little rundown, right? We're gonna talk about what mastering is how it compares to mixing, have to throw in a little bit about metadata and deliverables, two of my favorite words, especially in an education setting. Critical listening skills, tools we use, got a demo, and I will make time for lots of Q&A. If you do have questions at any time, feel free to throw them in the chat and I'll try to keep track of it and answer them along the way. Um, as you know, one thing that's hard about teaching over Zoom is I can't always see you, so I can't tell if, uh, I'm boring you or if you're totally lost or where we're at. So um, I will kind of pause periodically to check in. All right, who am I? Just just so y'all know, um, I got a lovely intro there. So thank you. But I've been doing this for about 20 years. I had the incredible good fortune to get an internship somewhat randomly off of Craigslist posting that opened doors for me. And uh, I worked really, really, really hard to take advantage of that opportunity. I put in the long hours that many people in this industry do, especially in the early years. And I wound up working um, at the lodge first and then later at the magic shop in New York before moving out here and starting my own studio. So the big question, um, do y'all know what mastering is? like? If I put you on the spot and asked you to, to define it, do you think you could? <laughs> I know it's like, it feels like a rhetorical question because it's hard in this setting to actually get a good answer. There was one thumbs up. <laughs> good, good. Um, for those of you who make your own music and, and may even release it, sometimes mixing and mastering gets combined into one process. That's a little bit of a reality of the way we make music today. Is it ideal? Maybe not. Um, I'm reading in the chat now. Yes, yeah, so we've got some good answers, right? First and foremost, it's preparing music for release. And it, it's making sure 
that it sounds exactly as it's supposed to sound and that it's going to sound good whether you're listening on like $10,000 speakers or your phone or in your car. Translatability. It is also about making things sound consistent and cohesive, especially if you might have an album that was recorded in five different studios over a year and you have tracks that just live in different sonic spaces. The mastering engineer's job is to make them feel like they belong together and that they sound like one story from start to finish. So that does mean loudness. Um, I don't know if you've heard the term loudness wars. It's something that we hear a lot in the mastering world. <clears throat> I think it's a little passe to talk about it. Like different music feels right at different levels of loudness. And that's something that you learn from working on it and from comparing it to other great sounding records. So I'm going to kind of skip. We'll punt the loudness discussion for another time. Um, one thing to be aware of, though, is that there are a lot of services out there that are um, automated and using incredible AI technology and neural nets to replicate the, you know, sort of mastering type process. The real difference between that and a human mastering engineer comes down to things like quality control and communication and personal aesthetics. Not that I imprint my own personal aesthetics on the music that I work on, but more that I'm able to work with my clients and say, hey, what do you want? What do you want this to sound like? I'll give you an example. Um, the record I worked on that, that Adria played at the beginning, Pachi Man, I worked on another record by some friends of his called International Dub Ambassadors. And they sent me a couple singles, I mastered them, and they they sent, came back to me for revisions. And they were like, you know, this sounds great, but it sounds modern. And we don't want reggaeton, we want 70s reggae. We want the bass to be more mellow and less clear and less punchy and less intense. And I thought that was such a great revision. That was such a great moment of communication between like mastering engineer and artist because they were able to convey to me, hey, this is one way it could sound, but it's not the way we want it to sound. We want it to sound this way. And I did that. I just sort of redid the work and chilled out the low end and made it a little more 70s mellow reggae. They liked it and, and you know, now, now we're doing another album together. So mixing, by contrast, is where you balance and arrange all of the different sounds. And typically you work in multi-tracks, right? You may have 48 tracks worth of stuff that you are combining and balancing and spacing within the stereo field or surround if you're working in immersive audio. Mastering is that final process. So typically I work from a stereo mix. I have some flexibility to change the balance of the instruments, but anything I do, is applied across the whole stereo mix. So I can't bump up your vocals if they are too low. And I certainly can't tune a bad note uh, at the mastering stage. Any questions so far? This is a metaphor I really love with a hat tip to my friend and colleague, Heba Kadri, who's another amazing, amazing mastering engineer. Um, the mastering engineer is like the person at the art gallery who picks the lighting and the wall color and the framing and where things are framed and um, makes sure that all of the artwork is shown in its best possible presentation. So I thought that was a really good metaphor. We're not the artists, but we are very much in charge of how the art is presented to the world. Um, <clears throat> Okay, questions. Uh oh, I don't know what the why not was referring to. Rich, can you sure thing. give me some? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, and thanks for being here. You're a huge asset. Um, yeah, I am unmuted. So, uh, if you get a lousy mix, uh, it sounds like at the mastering level, your area of responsibility, you don't want to touch it. Do you send it back to the original? Mix artist and tell him these vocals suck. You need to fix this, or do you drop it into a multi-track, a DAW, and you fix it? 
That's a really good question. I, I will say a lot of it depends on your relationship with the client, which might be the artist or might be the mix engineer. Um, some mix engineers that I work with frequently, if they send me something and I feel like there's something that would be better, like a problem that would be better addressed at mixing, I'll kick it back and say, hey man, can you uh, check out the low end? It's really flubby. Or can you send me a vocal up mix? That's a really easy way to make a record sound and you know build a trusting relationship with a client. Sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes there's no money to go back and remix or let's be real, people lose their mix sessions. They can't find the original stuff. That happens way more often than I wish. And then I dig into my toolbox and figure out what I can do to mm -hmm. attempt to reshape a mix and make it work. Um, other questions in the chat, isotope plugins. Uh, I use them all the time. I don't use all of them. There are some that I gravitate to and some that I'm not crazy about. I think that's probably the case for most people using it, but I think Isotope is generally doing phenomenal work in the audio world and I fully uh, support what they're doing. The one tool you might be thinking of is um, <clears throat> in Ozone, they have a tool called Master Assist. And Master Assist is really fun. I actually do use it to give me information. I don't use it as like a shortcut to mastering a track, but I use it to give me information about like, hey, what does the AI say? about this track. I want to know what the AI hears versus what I'm hearing. And then I can make some information based on that. <clears throat> and yes, other good metaphors. All right, I'll keep going so we can get to the demo. So this is what I do. I prepare audio for distribution. I get sonic balance, optimal loudness. I fix any problems. I know you always hear that term. We'll fix it in mastering. Well, you know, I'm the last stop. So if there's a problem, I'm going to fix it. I QC, quality control. I add metadata and I create deliverables. And yes, I highlighted those last three because I think they are such an important part of this process and something that gets glossed over a lot, especially in education. It's a lot more fun to play around with EQs and compressors than to talk about spreadsheets. But y'all, we have to do this stuff. It's a really important part of being a professional audio engineer in mastering and mixing in post-production in podcast editing. Anywhere you're working in audio, it's important to listen for quality control. And for me, that means I put on the headphones, I listen to the album start to finish with no distractions. And that way I can be confident that what I am sending out to be replicated is exactly what I want it to be. Metadata. That's all the information you need about your project, which for me usually means like, hey, what's your artist's name? Sometimes I just know the person's name. I don't know what their artist's name is. I need song titles. I need album titles. I need ISRC codes, which might be something you have not heard of, but that is a special code you register for with the RIAA. Again, that's like a rabbit hole we can go down another day but um, it tags your song to you and it's one of the ways you get paid. And then creating deliverables, man, that is, that is the bulk of my job. Sometimes I have to spend a whole day just creating deliverables, but that is the files that I deliver for distribution. So that means um, the files that get uploaded to Bandcamp <clears throat> or Spotify. And that means the files that go to the person who is cutting the lacquers to be made into vinyl. Again, that's, that's how I get paid. I get paid when I deliver the vinyl masters. Um, tiny bit more on metadata. Then I promise we'll get into the demo. Here's what you need to know, right? Who made the record? Are these song titles spelled correctly? Because sometimes when I make um, something that will be turned into CDs, I encode them with CD text. And if I spell a song title wrong, it's going to be wrong on everyone's CD player. Song order. <clears throat> that is something that changes sometimes. I got to keep on top of that. Um, I need to know, are we doing digital only? Are we making CDs? Are we making vinyl? That all impacts the work that I do. Sometimes I just like to know really basic stuff like, hey, what's the sample rate? What are we working at here? 
Um, this is an example that, uh, of a spreadsheet that I think you should all take notes and then adopt into your own workflow because you can make this just, you know, throw up a Google spreadsheet and develop a template for all of your projects, a template that works for you. Um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel here because templates already exist that you can adopt. But here's a really good example of something where it's like, hey, here's all the information I need to know. Here's the title, release date, label, UPC code, here are the song titles, here's some publishing information, everything you need to know. If you make a blank template, every time you work on a project, boom, you just make a new one, fill out the info, you will always have it. Because then when it comes down to it, <clears throat> sometimes you have to make these deliverables. And here's one um, I did recently that I highlighted because it was such a massive project. This is what, six folders of deliverables for what was essentially like a massive box set project. This is six sides of, wait, one, two, three, four, six sides of vinyl. It's a three LP set I had to make a side split for each side of vinyl. So you can see I have side A, side B through F, right? Quality control, that's a lot of listening. And then I had to make 27 master files in the 192K 24-bit masters, the 4416 CD masters. I had to do an edit because we did a, a one CD version. So I had to do an edit and create the same thing again this one project, it took me like two full days just to create the deliverables. That's like the level of work and detail that goes in to a, a mastering project like this. Um, and yes, this is how I named all these files. This one was really complicated because the like M-11 in the file name refers to the actual physical tape that these recordings came off of. So that was a way for us to track back and be like, oh, the first five songs came off of tape 11 and then whatever, it gets really, really deep with this stuff. The flip side of this is sometimes someone will have me master a single and I'll master it <clears throat> and it'll be on the streaming services in like a day. So we're kind of like a, a real range there in, in the process that this stuff goes through. This is what this project looked like when it was released. You know, so there you go. All of the hard work I did mastering and restoring that project and creating, you know, hundreds of files for deliverables turned into this really beautiful box set. Yay. Okay. I told you, you don't have to reinvent the wheel here. Here are some resources. Um, I can throw these links in the chat at some point. But you can also look them up. They are at grammy.com slash technical dash guidelines, or you can search for them pretty easily and they'll come up on the Grammy site. This is through the Recording Academy and really smart people working in audio production. We have recommendations for high res music. That's it's all about deliverables. It's all about file naming and folder hierarchies and stuff that if you adopt it into your workflow, will make your life much, much easier. They also have stuff for surround sound and, and Lots of great technical documents. Um, here's what the website looks like. So again, if you just search for it on grammy.com, you will come up with all of these. And like I said, someone else already did the work. You just get to adopt it to your particular workflow needs. And I, I stress all this stuff because it's a big, crucial part of the mastering workflow. I know it's not as much fun as listening to music and playing with plugins, but it's a huge part of what I do and it's really important, but it's also important in any audio job. Like this is straight up job skills stuff. This is stuff that will help you get and keep a job because everyone loves an engineer who knows where the files are, who knows what they're labeled, who knows what the sample rate and bit depth is and who can deliver like that. Thanks for putting the, the link in the chat. Okay. Um, oh, so the pro I'm reading the questions. So, okay. Let's see. Yes, I'm going back a little bit. Uh, the Errol Garner project was quarter inch tape. Um, the Symphony Hall concert that I did was quarter inch mono, full track mono at seven and a half inches per second. Uh, I work with tape a lot, got my tape machine on behind me. I had to, I was working on a tape before this class. I had to 
stop, <laughs> go back and finish it after class. Um, I do use a ton of data storage, but fortunately storage is cheap. So I have a, I don't know, like humongous server where I keep everything. I also back up to the cloud and I have catastrophic backup. Uh, I pay for a service called Backblaze, which is catastrophic backup, meaning like if a meteor hits my studio, my stuff is backed up at Backblaze and I can retrieve it all. Um, let's see. And yes, there is a difference in mastering depending on the delivery format. Sometimes um, if I'm working for vinyl, I will be a little more a little more conservative with loudness levels, certainly a little more conservative with stuff I might be doing to the low end and I'm more mindful of things like sibilance. I don't cut vinyl, so I always trust whoever I'm sending it off to cut the vinyl to reach out to me if there are any problems. Um, let's see, did I get all the questions? Any other questions so far? We're getting to the demo soon. I think we should go to the demo now. This, this is my setup slide, right? So what we're really getting into here is like so much of the work we do in audio and in music, we are an intersection of art and science. I know we all understand frequency and amplitude and the physics of how sound works, but we also have to be sensitive to how those sounds make us feel. And when things feel balanced and when they feel harsh and when they feel distracting and when they feel immersive, right? I can use, I can use whatever language works to describe this stuff, but really it's about connecting um, scientific side of your brain where you can understand what's happening physically with sound waves, with your heart. You gotta, gotta listen with your heart and your soul, right? You gotta feel it. So I have a demo for you and I will zip on over to Pro Tools. I have two songs here that I was thinking, but I think maybe we'll do this one. So real quickly, this is um, a little bit of a cobbled together version of how I might master a track. And I can show you here, the way I have it set up is I have my mix up here in the top row. Uh, I can move it around wherever I want because I'm not concerned with um, a sequence yet. I'm treating this as a single. So like I just plopped it anywhere. The top track here I have labeled mix. I am, usually when I do this like for real, I have a, an analog console here. So usually I go out into my analog gear and then back in, but uh, we're staying digital here. So I am busing to this aux track which I leave right in there just for visual clarity. And then from the bus, uh, from the aux track, I am busing to a master track, which I have in input mode. That means if I play this back and record it, I will record this song along with any plugins that I put in this pathway. That's a really simple capture loop. I am playing this track out, I'm doing some stuff to it, and I'm going to record it back in on the master track. So here's a, um, a little cheat that I like to do because it's super easy. If I copy this down, this is the mix, same, same song, right? If I pop this in and out of input mode, I will go back and forth between listening to my master with all the plugins and when it's out of input mode, I am listening to just the mix. Now that's important because a cardinal rule of mastering is don't make it sound worse, right? So I always need to go back to what does this mix sound like? Am I going in the right direction or have I gone off the rails? So that's a good way to check myself. Um, you want to hear this song a little bit? I'm just going to play the mix for you. This is the song called What Happens Next, and this was self-produced by a woman named Isabel Braun, who I believe is based in London, and she had it, um, she sent it to me, and she's like, you know what, I know I self-produced this, but I really want it to sound like pop music, like 
you know, Billboard Top 100 Pop Music. So here's what we got to work with. This is the mix. Thoughts on the mix. Hopefully you could all hear it in stereo and translated reasonably well. Sometimes it's hard to know if you don't have something to hang your hat on, right? Like listening to that with no context, I would say, oh, I guess sounds pretty good, right? Yeah, that sounds, that sounds good, let's release it. But then let's say um, I'm going to pull up this Billie Eilish track for a comparison. Billie. Some crazy waveforms, huh? What do you want from me? Why don't you run from me? What are you wondering? What do you know? Why aren't you scared of me? Why do you care for me? When we all fall asleep, where do we go? Come here. Say it, spit it out. What is it? So now if we go back to our mix. This whole time I've been on my tiptoes. God knows what happens next. Like my first thought is like, it sounds tiny. Like the mix sounds like so wimpy and tiny it's a lovely song she's got a great voice it's a cool track but compared to billy eilish it's like different ball game right um i love the comments that are coming through in the chat i'm reading them yeah and you know a lot of times a mix will come to me and out of necessity because that's part of the mixing process there is a lot of headroom there's a lot of room for it to to grow um a lot of times I get mixes that are fairly dull and could use a lift, right? Like they just want to, I want to like expand them. Um, here's a Charlie XCX song that, I love this song, but I have to say like, it's a little intense sonically. But again, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to capture this top 40 pop sound. So let's listen to Charlie XCX. I was busy thinking about boys. Oh no, I just, it like, uh, choked up on me a little bit. Um, I'm about to throw a link in the chat here because I think this is super important to note. I buy high res tracks to use as reference tracks to help me understand the context of what popular music sounds like. I personally buy them from Kobas a lot of time because I am a big high fi nerd and Kobas is the streaming service that I subscribe to. Kobas is like Tidal or Spotify, but um, they stream in high res and you can buy high res tracks. So I can buy like a 24 bit wave file of this song. I also buy stuff at Bandcamp a lot. Um, it's really valuable to know what released music sounds like in its purest form 
So not an MP3 and definitely not something you ripped, ripped off of YouTube. A fun experiment I suggest you all do if, if you're up for it, maybe you can do it in a class, is um, buy a commercial track, 99 cents, and then uh, go rip it from YouTube on one of those like YouTube to MP3 conversion sites and compare them. And, you know, hear what the difference is. It's really valuable to know what the difference is because then you'll know what's missing when you're listening to something on YouTube and you'll know what the master file actually sounded like when it left the studio. Um, I know you'll notice this one's clipping. I, this session is in 48K for the purposes of Zoom. So I think this was probably a 44 file that I had to convert. That's why sometimes you'll get clipping. Also, maybe the master clipped. You never know with these things. Um, okay, so we've got a little bit of a ballpark now. We know that this song is pretty quiet. We know it's a little dull and it lacks this like body and intensity and punch. So, first thing we do in mastering. One, just want to note that I love using this Insight metering plugin. It gives you a lot of information. I do not master with my eyes, but I do master with my ears, my eyes, my heart, the whole thing. I think that's really important. Meters give you information. They confirm what you hear. I use them all the time. I use these. I have VU meters in my analog chain over here. Never underestimate the power and the value of good metering. Um, I'm looking at the chat. So question, when you're streaming, the compression is different. Yes. So all the streaming services have their own algorithms for what they do to music upon ingest and how it's played back to you. Sometimes what you are listening back to is an AAC converted from a WAV file. Sometimes it's an MP3. Sometimes things have been normalized. There's a lot that goes on. We don't always know. It's kind of a, a mystery to us. And it's obviously really frustrating as a mastering engineer or as an artist when you care about how your stuff sounds. Um, people throw around numbers a lot because you will hear things like Spotify normalizes it, minus 13 LUFS. You'll read that. And then you'll think, oh, well, I need to master everything to minus 13 LUFS. That's not at all how I work. It's not how any of my colleagues work. We are still mastering based on our ears and what sounds good with, it's not that we disregard the numbers because again, like that data is information that helps inform our work, but I do not think about LUFS or RMS or any of the measures of loudness when I'm working, I think about how things sound. So um, let's throw some plugins at this and see if we can make what happens next sounds a little bit more like Billie Eilish or Charlie XCX. The first thing I do is put in a final limiter. I'm gonna use the Fab Filter Pro L2. My final limiter is the last step in this chain. And I am putting a ceiling in there. My ceiling is gonna be minus 0.5 dB. And I have it at true peak limiting, which again, like we can go way into the weeds with some of these terms, but what I am doing is ensuring that my final master will not hit digital zero. That way I can prevent any potential distortion. And in fact, I'm giving it a little bit of a headroom. So when this does get converted to stream on Spotify or YouTube, there's like a little wiggle room there. And um, again, it won't clip. I'm trying to avoid hitting digital zero, going into the red and creating an opportunity for my sound file or my sound waves to like distort and sound yucky. Um, sometimes I just give it a little gain to start with, not much. I'm just trying to get a little loudness, get a sense of what it's gonna sound like. So if I put it in input mode. You keep your this whole time I've been on my tiptoes. God knows what happens next. I'm gonna listen to this chorus part for a while and see if we can dial in some loudness, some punchiness, just get it sounding like bigger and more beautiful. My baby could leave me tomorrow. I don't know what he'll do next. So I'm it's a little wimpy, right? 
let's throw a compressor at it. Um, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna do something a little, this one needs some punch, right? So I'm gonna start with this compressor. This is the Iron SPL compressor. I used to have this hardware and then I did a shootout with the plugin and the plugin sounded so good. I sold the hardware and bought the tape machine. So plugins, man, there is nothing to be ashamed about working in the box these days. These plugins are phenomenal. Um, I'm gonna get a lot of loudness out of this, but um, I'm gonna leave my threshold down for now. I don't wanna I don't want to crush this song. I don't want to like tamp down all the loud parts. I just want everything to get a little bigger. Maybe tuck in the top. So yeah. yeah. So Barely moving. I'm going to pop in and out of input mode so you can hear what we've done so far with just this tiny, tiny bit of compression. Is that coming through? It's always hard on Zoom. Um, what you should hear is it's, it's immediately just feels bigger. And it doesn't just feel louder. It doesn't feel like I turned up the clip gain or like turned up the volume knob. Um, already, okay, so I'm listening on Zoom in AirPods. Would I ever master a record this way? No, but that's, <laughs> that's how it works in Zoomland. Already I can hear what we would think of as gelling. It just feels more together. I attribute that to this particular plugin. Um, I think this one does a really nice job of creating loudness in an elegant way. Elegance a word you'll hear a lot in um, the way we describe like plugins and the tools we use, because I don't wanna come at this with like a bulldozer, right? I'm not trying to demolish this. I want a really beautiful way of making this loud and full and vibrant and balanced and all that good stuff, right? So if we go over here and look at our metering, we can see how we're doing with loudness. Lots of good info. We're still like, we're not even peaking at minus three yet. We have so much headroom to play with. So let's throw an EQ at it. This is pretty typical uh, part of my workflow, although it always depends on the project and um, what it needs and what plugins I feel like are gonna be the best suited to this one. Uh, I pulled up the Fab Filter Pro Q. This is a really good one to demo with because there's so much you can do with it. And um, oh, to answer the question, the limiter plugin I'm using is the Fab Filter Pro L. Uh, man, I don't get paid to use any of these tools, but I like the Fab Filter stuff. I like the Iron SPL stuff. I have another compressor I'm going to throw out this in a minute that you'll all really love. So if I play around with this, one thing I love about this plugin is, um, you know, when you're playing around with EQ, one of the techniques engineers use to dial that in is to do things like crank it way up and sweep around until you kind of feel the right sweet spot and then you dial it back. Or maybe you're like, where's that terrible sibilance? There it is, I'm gonna pull it way down and, you know, do stuff like that, right? This is, um, a great tool for incorporating what we hear with what we see. And again, like that's how mastering an audio production becomes so sort of multidisciplinary. Like you, you have to understand the science, you have to feel the sounds, you have to interpret what you're hearing, you have to know what your clients are going for aesthetically. It's like you're balancing a lot. All right, um, what would I do to this song?
There, okay, so I can't hear very well at all. <laughs> it makes this extra challenging, but based on knowing this song and then whatever I can interpret through Zoom through AirPods, um, I gave us a little bit of a high-end just lift, right? I tried to get some more punchiness out of our kick down here. I turned this into a dynamic EQ, which means I now have a threshold that I can play around with, get a little more punch, right? These are sophisticated tools. They're super fun to play with. And then we're trying to get a little more vocal body. So the vocal body here is like a little mid-range stuff, right? And then I was hearing, even through the AirPods, a little like uh, harshness that sometimes comes out in the high end. So I pulled down a little harshness here. This is a really simple EQ and you'll probably notice I'm doing really small attenuation and um, boosts. Like this is 1.2, this is 0.74. This one's quite a lot, but it's a shelf. So um, typically in mastering, we're making really small moves. It is not out of the question to do 0 0.1, 0 0.2 dB moves just to nudge things into place. Um, let's go back and check ourselves against the mix. So erotic, so erotic. Yeah, it's so unpredictable. So erotic and I love it. Yeah, it's time I've been on my We're getting somewhere, right? This song really needs a, like a I don't know, a punch in the face. This this needs something big, right? It might need some bass. I can't hear bass on these, so if I were in the if I were on the monitors, I could probably hear them better. It needs some oomph. That's a good way to put it, right? Like it needs some guts. So it's still too quiet compared to this. Hit him, hit him back. I'm sorry that I missed you, buddy. In fact, here's what I'm going to do. I do this a lot in mastering. It kind of feels weird, but okay. So now when I go in and out of input mode, in input mode, we're going to hear the master of Isabel's song. And in not input mode, we're going to hear Charlie. So then we can hear a commercially released track that maybe this song would wind up on a playlist with and the master that we're working on. So again, it's like, we need to know what, what ballpark we're playing in. I don't know why I'm using sports metaphors. That's a terrible thing for me to, to pull out, but uh, roll with me, right? We need to know what ballpark we're playing in. If this track is going to wind up on a playlist, we want it to sound like it makes sense with the other songs on that playlist. And the Charlie XDX song is way more compressed and way brighter. I think it's a little too bright, so I wouldn't push this song that far. I'd probably go back and find another reference track. But um, I'm going to throw at this another compressor. So let's try, oh, let's try this one. Okay. Yeah, I have a ton of tools. You know why? Because I got bad news for you all. Uh, I know sometimes we like to say, like, it's not the tools you have, it's how you use them. And I wish that were true. But I got to tell you, in audio production, there are tools that cost a lot of money and sound phenomenal. And over the course of my year, I have paid a lot of money to acquire those tools. And my work is easier and I think my work sounds better because of the tools that I have. That is an unfortunate reality of our industry. You, if you're going to do this work independently, you're going to spend a lot of money on a really fast computer and hard drive space and monitors and acoustic treatment and plugins and outboard gear and it never ends. So reality check for you, right? This, uh, this plugin costs a lot of money and I think it sounds amazing. Sorry about the, you know, I could use whatever we have here. What's the built-in one? What's the built-in? Like that one, right? 
In fact, I always say do a shootout. See what you can accomplish with the, the built-in stock plugins for Pro Tools and then download demos of other stuff, right? That's how you train your ears to understand the nuances. Um, I love this one though. I think this one's super fun. There are different styles. This is one of those things where like, you could go deep into the math behind the algorithms that make up this compressor, or you can just use your ears and kind of tease out what feels right to you. That kind of depends on what your mode is. You wanna know more about the math behind this? You're gonna to have to dig into the manual in a way that I did not. But here we go, we're, go we're about to get some like power out of this song. My baby could leave me tomorrow I don't know what he'll do next So erotic, so erotic Yeah, he's so unpredictable Can't decide which mode I like better. Um, we'll leave it at punch for now. We'll see how it sounds. We have just added quite a lot of loud to, loudness to this. So now we have three compressors and they're all doing different things. So that's another thing to know about mastering and, and mixing as well, right? I use a lot of different tools subtly and they all have a different reason for being within the chain where they're at, right? So I'm starting off with this compressor, hitting it pretty lightly just to get some gelling and loudness at the beginning of the process. Then we're throwing some EQ at it, try to get a little clarity out of the vocals, a little more body, a little more punch in the low end, a lift in the high end, right? Then we're hitting it hard. You saw the gain reduction here. We're hitting this compressor pretty hard to get like loudness and punch and power. And then we still have this dude down here catching all of our overs. So um, the Charlie vocals, yes, they're much more defined and they're higher in the mix, right? They're more upfront. We could get surgical and do something with this Isabel track to make it more like that. We have to kind of figure out what's gonna work there. Like, do we do we want it to sound like the Charlie XCX track or do we want it to be its own thing? Where's, where's the middle ground, right? That's what we're always doing. We need to find that sweet spot. And I don't think for this track, the sweet spot is exactly the sonic profile of the Charlie XCX track. I think it's somewhere in the middle. Um, and as for the Weiss compressor, it is, it's, compressing and then adding gain. So I'm adding, I don't know, however many clicks that is, like four dB of gain, it's, it's kind of a lot. Um, and you'll see the gain reduction here. My baby could leave me tomorrow, I don't know what he'll do next. So erotic, so erotic, yeah, it's so unpredictable. So it's funny, like I say I'm hitting this pretty hard, but you'll see it's like we're still not, we're not slamming it. Not that there's anything wrong with slamming. Sometimes you need to hit stuff hard. Um, I'm gonna do a real quick check-in with Charlie and see how we're doing in terms of loudness. We're getting closer. It's not as sharp. So the loudness feels a little better to me, but it doesn't feel as like defined. Okay, I'm gonna throw some crazy plugins at you now. Now we're getting advanced. Also just saved out of habit. I always got saved, right? Um, I'm gonna put this over here. Here is, oh, it's all the way down here. Here's one of these cool new plugins that uses AI technology to interpret the waveform and um, 
give you a really sophisticated way of playing with the frequency. Um, and to answer the question in the chat, the reference track being the same volume or loudness, um, that's something you have to interpret as the engineer. Like, you're right, it's not like an apples and apples situation, but sometimes it is. Like, sometimes someone will give me a reference track and I'll have to get much closer sonically to what that reference track is. Or sometimes if I'm doing a whole album, I do a song that becomes my guide for the rest of the album. And then the rest of the album has to sound comparably loud to that first track that I did. Comparably bright, comparable low end, right? So that's when, like when you're doing an album and you're trying to find that cohesiveness, that might mean one track gets a huge high end boost and another track, I might have to attenuate the high end just to get everything to live in the same sonic space. Um, this one, now I feel like I should have found a better reference track for this because I don't think the Charlie XCX is like a bullseye reference track. I think I should have downloaded like a Dua Lipa song or something a little less um, aggressive. I don't think this Isabel track needs to be as aggressive sonically as Charlie XCX. But um, I'm going to show you some of the more sophisticated tools that um, people are using these days. They're like, you know, they're based on neural nets. They feed them a lot of information and then they interpret what, they, what the frequency and loudness spectrum is and uh, play around with it. This is one called Unfilter by a company called Synaptic. And um, this is <laughs> this is something, boy, you can you can screw things up real good pretty easily. This is one of those tools that you use with a very, very light touch, but it can be magical for giving that like extra body. So if I play this um, visually and aud audially, you should get a sense of what's going on. I'm gonna play around with it for a minute and then I'll explain what I just did. I'm also gonna turn the processing off to start. So erotic, so erotic. Yeah, it's so unpredictable. This one's fun. So this is like a combo, I guess like a dynamic, it's like a really sophisticated dynamic EQ squared. Um, it is based on a threshold that I'm playing around with by raising and lowering these dots. And it will really selectively boost and attenuate based on frequency and that threshold. So in this case, what I'm trying to do is bump up the mid range. So those vocals pop through a little bit more and have a little more clarity. And I'm trying to get some really good stuff going in that low end, like that kind of ping pongy bass. I want that to feel really clear and punchy, but I don't want to get too much muddiness. So I don't want to, I, I don't, I kind of want to carve off some of that stuff in the lower mids. And uh, that's what you get to do with something like this. So whereas I would need to, do some incredibly sophisticated EQ and compression trickery, I can use one tool to dynamically and, and in a sophisticated way, like pull out the best frequencies that I want at the times that I want them to pop forward, um, but also not just do this sort of like across the board EQ boost or attenuation. Um, and if it does sound like it's sharpening, that's great. That might be a little bit of this high end stuff. It's kind of pulling up those transients that we hear in the high end that just make it sound a little more clear. Um, so in terms of using like notch EQs, I use them all the time. You can get really, really detailed with this stuff. I haven't done them in this mix because I can't hear well enough to dial them in through this way, but I would very frequently do something like a notch EQ 
where the sibilance is getting really nasty. Or um, sometimes there's like a vocal resonance in the room. Like it really has to do with the room where this was recorded, that something builds up and I might have to take something out like there or something like that. Um, I'll take those out because I don't really know if they're relevant to this one. So any other questions so far? Um, let's just record this chorus in. Let's see what we've got. Uh, let's see. I think for a, a quick demo, that sounded pretty good. We could always do some more fine tuning. Um, if we really wanted to have some fun with this, I'm kind of watching the clock and I want to make sure we have time to listen to other people's work. Um, and also you're probably all sick of sitting in front of Zoom, but um, one thing that we could do that would be fun is mute all these. Pull up Ozone. Try the Master Assist tool. This whole time I've been on my tiptoes. God okay. knows what happens Make next. it really intense. My baby could leave me tomorrow. I don't know what he'll do next. You're so erratic, so erratic. Yeah, you're so unpredictable. So erratic and I love it. Yeah, you're so erratic. This whole time I've been on my tiptoes. So this is what um, Isotope's really brilliant AI thinks we should have done. Um, oh, they wanted us to attenuate some low end and do some upper mid boosts. They didn't know we have no dynamics. They have a dynamic EQ that probably chills out some resonances that pop through a little bit. And then their maximizer is, well, they're giving us a lot. So I'm gonna go back over here. This is the master that we created, right? Well, now here's what we get to do. Um, let's compare our master to Isotope's approximation of what this should sound like. And then let's just, uh, you know, interpret it. And I have no idea how these are gonna compare. So this is the Isotope master. And then when I take it out of input, it will be our master. This whole time I've been on my tiptoes. God knows what happens next. I don't know, you got any thoughts on that? High end super different. Um the the ozone master um was a little more aggressive with the high end. I think the our master was a little more, yeah, gentle is a nice way to put it. Um a little more elegant, maybe. I, you know, if I were doing this for real, I would spend more time on it. I'm watching the questions, right? I agree. I think the isotope was too aggressive. Um, but I, I also asked it to be aggressive. So, you know, that's sort of, that's what the tool does. What it does in practice, though, it gives you a sense of like, oh, hey, this is what AI thinks we should do. Is that information I can use? Sure. It might change my mind about the high end. Um, I don't think it's, it's not a substitute for like human aesthetics and the human communication that comes with mastering, but it's certainly a tool that I use when I need more information. Um, let me see if I can go back and hit any of the questions. I saw one about expanding the stereo field. Um, there are a bunch of different tools we can use to do that. I'm going to show you three. I got three tools for you. One is 
in this compressor, we have the option for our little style algorithm to be wide. And a lot of compressors will have like a slight widening option. This one actually sounds great. I don't use it all that often, only if it if I am working with a mix that feels really collapsed in the center and I need it to punch out a little bit. So sometimes, you know, your compressor compressors will have an option to widen. Sometimes um, you can use a tool like Imager. And this can help you play around, like you can bump up your stereo width a little bit. Or this is one, like sometimes if you need to do a little like tightening up of the low end, you can actually mono out your low end a little bit and sort of focus in that bass, punch out that high end sparkle. So um, the ozone imager is another good option for that. And then here is a sort of like, uh, you know, graduate school level EQ thing that I do sometimes. Sometimes instead of doing just a shelf on the high end, I will put this in mid side mode. So you know how um, with a tool like this, you're uh, boosting or attenuating the left and the right as a stereo signal. Well, this throws a little math at it and you can boost or attenuate the center of your signal or the sides of your signal. In this case, if I give a pretty aggressive side boost to the high end, it lifts it all up on the sides and it makes it feel a little wider. Uh, similarly, you can do kind of the opposite you know, this is something that I just by no means do this on every track. It's like as needed, right? And sometimes very, very delicately, but you can roll off the mid-range low end. Oh wait, no, sides, sorry. I was just thinking different end of the spectrum. Roll off the sides low end and it tightens up your signal. And then your bass, instead of sounding like whoa, 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 it kind of tightens it up. So that's fun ways to play around with the stereo field using different tools. Um, oh, for splitting the stereo track and working each side independently, I almost never do that because you very quickly run into phase coherence issues where um, suddenly things will sound fuzzy or tipped. Tipped is a weird way to put it, but I, I think that way a lot when I'm listening. Like if you're listening and you kind of feel like it's this, that's not that's not working. You got to like get it back coherent and focused. So in mastering, we almost always do the same thing on the left and the right. And if we don't, it's because there's something wrong that we're trying to fix. In mixing, however, yeah, in mixing, you can put things on different tracks and do different things with them with great effect. Um, rough and ready rules about dynamics processing. It is case by case, although I will say it's fairly typical to do something like, okay, let's get a little light gelling. Let's do some sculpting. Let's compress that. Then sometimes I'll throw in another EQ that's more surgical. That's a very reasonable way to think about it. Um, it's just the you know, it's specific to the content. I love these questions, keep them coming. What else can I share? I do have some tracks mixed by folks in the class that we can listen to. I listened to them yesterday. I thought they were absolutely lovely, really sophisticated composition and very well balanced. Um, how do I use my, oh, that, I mostly play back. Right now, the heads that I have on this, uh, in fact, don't even have a record head. I have record heads um, in the closet, but I do play back of tapes throughout the history of magnetic recording. I've, I've got a tape on here from 1976 that I got to finish after class. Um, good question about gelling and compression ratios. Um, you'll notice this one does not have a ratio tool. I'd have to like, I'd have to read the manual again. I actually read the manual on this one. This is a great manual. I don't know what the, what they think of as the ratio for this. I didn't even play around with some of these other things, but you can do it in parallel mode. Here's another place where you can play with the stereo width. Um, 
very, very low ratios for gelling. I mean, it might even be 1.1 to 1 or 1.2 to 1. That's just sort of like tucking everything in. Um, other questions? That's a good question. Do I look at the waveforms? I, I do, but here's one thing I want to caution you. I, I find with my students a lot, they'll do this thing um, or they'll do something like, like this. Whoops, didn't mean to go that far in. Like play around with the clip gain. In fact, actually that was just an interesting experiment. You know what? Look at, I just added almost eight dB to this. Look at the waveform compared to this waveform that we compressed. You can totally see the difference in that percussion, right? You can see what we did to it. So yeah, I use my eyes all the time to confirm and reinforce what I hear. Which of these sounds better? I don't know. The other thing I, I see my students doing that I um, actually caution against is playing around with this. Oh, you crushed it. Your mix is so loud. Well, yeah, it's because I just played around with a waveform. Like this is still we knew a that tiny this little song. End. I think we may have reached our limit. So the waveform is just another one of those tools that we use to understand the whole process. Um, I use it all the time, but I don't rely on it. And I know how easy it is to be tricked by a waveform, especially when you start playing around with that. Um, which also brings brings up the idea of monitoring. So um, in mastering, I also typically monitor at pretty much the same loudness. I have this metric halo. It's on mute right now because we're on Zoom. But I will monitor at zero. And that is how I have it set. And that means I understand what, I understand how how loud things should be when I have my monitors dialed in at that level. If I turn it down, you know, things might sound quieter. Am I going to push it too far and make it too loud? Because to me in this room, it sounds quieter. You got to like check yourself on that. So I leave things. I like consistency. It's important in mastering. Um, as far as side chaining, uh, I don't do it much in mastering. You can. And some of the tools that I have have it built in. Um, this one, for example, you know, amount and parallel mix, you're essentially side chaining there. You are playing around with the processed, unprocessed mix of content. But I don't do I don't do anything fancy with um, in the DAW, like creating a side chain. You know, a lot of times what I'm trying to do is keep things very. Um, I, I just want like a clarity to the whole process. So I'm not throwing every, like a mix has to be pretty messed up for me to um, throw like some of these really more sophisticated techniques at it. Um, I do wanna make sure we have time to listen. So I'm gonna zing you over to, okay, I pulled these up in Isotope. I know I can pull them up in Pro Tools. Oops, we have to send Isotope out through Zoom. Okay. This is Isotope's RX um, standalone app. And I pulled them up in here because this is one of the ways that I listen to audition things. Um, why do I use this? This one is one of my favorite tools and I use it every day. So I've been talking a lot about what we hear and then the information we can gather from the tools that we use. As you can see, this one gives you a spectral rendering a visual rendering of your song so i could zing it over here and then it looks more like a waveform you'd be familiar with like i can see some percussion hits there right but you can also do halvesies if you like it that way i like to look at this it gives me a really good sense of what's going on in terms of frequency it's the timeline like you would expect and then the intensity so i can see things like there's like a melody line and I can follow it and I can highlight stuff and I can tell what's going on up here. Just gives me a lot of information. 
I know we're gonna play it in a minute, I promise. I also like to use this one. Waveform statistics. Again, like the numbers are super fun just to inform you, just to give you information about what you're hearing. In this case, it gives me a really good sense of how high we're peaking, which is perfect for a mix. A lot of headroom for mastering, not crazy loud, but also like you're taking advantage of the bits in your mix. Um, gives you like a total RMS or an LUFS. You can adjust all these parameters. Gives you a sense of the left and right balance. This looks very reasonably balanced. If it weren't, these numbers would give you some information about what might be going on. Let's listen to it and then we can talk about it. I don't want to cut these off. I want to listen to the whole song, but I'm also keeping an eye on the clock. Um, that's lovely. What do you, what do you all think? What do you, what do you hear? It's really beautiful. It's, it's really well balanced. If I got this in my studio to master, I'd be like, great, let's roll. Let's go. Um, One thing I I think about this a lot based on the music that I'm getting these days, and then again, working on historic music, uh, acoustically recorded instruments, like physical instruments that have strings and hammers and are played physically with a human's body and go into a microphone uh, and digital samples that I know we, we all use a lot of. Um, digital samples are, they're sort of, they already exist in their world. like. Their world is digital world. It has digital logic, meaning you can place them anywhere and that's fine. And you can manipulate them on the frequency spectrum and that's fine, it's a digital sound. Acoustic instruments, it's not that there have to be more rules about what it should be, but it makes more sense to us if a guitar sounds like a guitar and um, a piano sounds like a piano and a voice sounds like a human singing in a space. So one of the things I first thought when I heard this song um, had to do with reverb. And it, this isn't like a right or wrong thing, it was just an observation. Think about the reverb on the lead vocals and how that kind of lives with the reverb that might be on the instruments and also the reverb that's on the, the chorus part. Um, when like the chorus of voices come in. Again, I'm like not prescribing anything here because this is a sonic space that this composer is creating. Um, sometimes we think that we want that reverb to be consistent across the instruments and the voices because we want it to feel like it's all in the same room. Like that was the coherence that we're going for. And then sometimes we're playing around with imagined spaces. And you might do something like throw some crazy reverb on the chorus because you want the chorus to feel like it's an internal monologue, not the person singing in a room in front of people, but like what's going on in their head. And that gives you freedom to play around with the sonic space you're creating. 
do you, you see where I'm going with, with that? Does that make sense? Um, I think this one's really well balanced. And I, you know, I, I don't have any like critiques of where the vocal sits or even the balance of the other instruments. I think it doesn't feel harsh to me. It doesn't feel like there's no frequency poking out at me. So all around a really beautiful mix. And I think it's more just in the aesthetic choices that the creator would make around reverb and how that reflects the sonic space that you are sculpting and the story you're telling. Um, any other, any other thoughts? Yeah, dual tracking is a way to achieve this or doubling vocals or, um, yeah, there are like so many ways you can play around with sonic space. Some songs are meant to sound like a live recording and they're meant to sound like people playing together in a room with instruments. And some songs are these imagined spaces where you can break all sorts of rules of physics when it comes to frequency response and reverb, right? That's up to the, the creator. Um, the guitar picks, that's a really good question. This veers off into the restoration. Um, in this one, the guitar picks did not bother me. I like, personally, again, this is my aesthetic choice here. I like when I can tell that there's some like humanness to it. So I like a good lip smack every now and then and like a guitar squeak, um, things like that. But, or string, like when you play a string and it squeaks, Yes, like things like that. Um, I have a rule of thumb and I call it, I actually have a name for it, uh, red flag listening. So it's nothing to do with the recent meme about red flags, but this actually, I have to give a hat tip to one of my mentors, the mastering engineer, Sarah Register, another amazing engineer I worked with in my early days. And she kind of taught me this way of listening where you just immerse yourself in the song, usually on headphones, uh, for quality control. And then anytime you're distracted by something, a little red flag pops up in your brain and I would throw down a marker and I'd be like, that lip smack was distracting, boom. Or that guitar pick noise, too much, boom. Or that guitar squeak when they like, you know, change whatever chord they're playing, distracting. Or that edit's bad, fix it. Or sibilance is too intense there. So those are little red flags that I hear when I'm doing critical listening. I do, it's like a constant thing for, it's a learned thing, right? So ask me how much I enjoy listening to music for pleasure. It's a blessing and a curse to be able to hear all these things. You train yourself to hear them. And I might, I can't, I'm not gonna be able to find one. There's no way I'm gonna find one just by like scanning. We'd have to listen to the whole song. But like, let's say this little thing right here, so you get to read these waveforms and then you can pick them out right away. Your workflow gets fast. Let's say that's like a, a guitar pick that's too intense. If I found that distracting and I thought this song would be better with it just sort of etched out a little bit, I would go over here, take this spectral repair tool, which interpolates information from before and after the signal and then rewrites the little section you highlight here. And I might just be like, boom. Okay, gone. So assuming that was like a, an intense little pick noise, it is now gone, it will distract no one. And if you do this right, it's gone cleanly. Um, okay, I'm going back to the questions now. So suggestions for reference tracks. Oh, I actually had a thought because this reminded me of something else. Um, Man, for reference tracks, I gotta say, I go to the streaming services and I just pop through lots and lots of stuff. Or I ask the artists that I'm working with. This has a little bit, I'm gonna play a little bit. Okay, general answer and specific answer. Generally, I would wanna know what those vocals should sound like. So I would look for a very, female vocal forward song in this approximate genre where I thought the vocals sounded amazing and I would use that as a guide. Guitars, I want those guitars to sound amazing. So I would find 
something recorded with acoustic guitar that sounded smashing and not smashing as in loud. I mean, just like excellent. And then I would use that as my guide. Specifically, I would go to, I'm thinking like um, Wise Blood is the first band that comes to mind. I'm not even sure if that would be a ballpark, but the vocalist for that band has this amazing like Karen Carpenter, clear Isabel voice. That might be something to listen to. This is off the top of my head. <laughs> um, I want to make time to play the other songs too. I'm going backwards alphabetically. So if it's cool with y'all, I'm just going to hit play on this next one and we can keep going and just talk about what we hear and what we might want to achieve in mastering and how we would even make some of those decisions. Whatever it is that you all want to hear about, like, you know, I'm here for you. So keep the questions coming. Again, I hate hitting stop because it's such a transporting, like otherworldly song. Um, and the stereo imaging on this one is wild, right? So tell me all what, like, what's what are your first thoughts now that we're an hour and a half into, you know, mas mastering class? Anyone have any thoughts on that? Mysterious, yeah. Oh, the transients you're thinking. This is your song, Justin, right? Yep. Um, that's something that we can tame in mastering and often do. I mean, transients can be such a lovely thing because they give definition and detail. And then sometimes they can just be a little too much. So when you would, like if I had used the iron SPL compressor on this, it would just kind of tuck in some of the sharp bits and make it feel a little um, less harsh where those transients are living. Um, I'll tell you one thing I thought of, I actually think it sounds fine in the mix, but if you were to turn this up, like if you were just to do, you know, gain, like I know if we did this, we would clip, but if you were to add like 6 dB or something, um, these sustained notes, synth notes here that are around like 900 Hertz, those would start to hurt a little bit. Like you would actually feel, oh, my ears kind of, it overloads them a little bit. Not in the mix, but if you were to turn it, just turn it up, that part would feel like too much. That's the kind of thing we address in mastering that en enables us to get loudness and body out of the whole mix. But the things, like when you turn it up and everything comes up, some things need to be tucked back in or they're going to hurt. Now, because of uh, the genre of this music or because of kind of aesthetically where it lives, um, I would probably have a conversation with this artist about living on the borders of intensity with this. Um, 
sometimes with music like this, you want to provoke a visceral response and you might want to push your listener and push the intensity of it. Like I have, I've been to amazing live concerts where things sounded intense and it made you feel great because of it. Or maybe it didn't make you feel great, but that was the intended response. So with the intensity of these mid-range synth notes, right? Do you want them to hurt or do you want them to be sort of um, lovely and just part of the mix? There is no right or wrong answer here. That's an aesthetic decision that we make. Um, most likely, if I were to master this, I would do some really gentle EQ in this mid-range to make sure that they didn't poke through so much that they hurt or that they kind of subsumed the whole mix when you were listening to it. I would want to make sure that a lot of this detail in the that that kind of comes out in the upper mids and in the high end was really like clear and crystalline. Would I put a limiter on it? Yep. Yeah. Everything I do gets a final limiter. Um, I might not push it to get a ton of gain out of the limiter, but I would definitely make sure that it was not ever going to hit zero. Although I could tell there was a limiter put on this because I can tell you have a you're you're peaking at like minus 0.25. So you've got the headroom built in. This one will not clip. And this one, you know, again. It's like you gotta, the ears and the head and the heart all work together. Uh, these numbers, if we're looking at loudness numbers, probably based on the content of the song and the genre, I would say it's reasonably loud. I wouldn't necessarily see uh, a need to push the loudness in this song. So, and that's, I did listen to this yesterday. I listened to the whole song, so I already know that this song lives in a good sonic space and doesn't need to be, it doesn't feel um, the way the Isabel Braun song, the mix that we had, it doesn't feel like, oh, this is unmastered. It's really quiet and it needs to be pushed. This one does not feel like it needs to be pushed. Um, shall we listen to the third song? I, I'm always, I always wanna make time for plenty of questions so keep them coming um, and Justin this is a beautiful track like I actually really like the intensity of this mid-range stuff I think it uh, I think it provokes in a nice way like I I like to be provoked as a listener though I think it's um it's not it's not too pleasant and I mean that as a sincere compliment like sometimes music needs to push you a little bit if it's too pleasant it becomes background this one I feel is a little more engaging because of the intensity. One more for you. Okay, I love looking at waveforms in this view, in the spectral view, because look at what's going on here. It's so beautiful, right? We don't even have to listen and we can appreciate this, but let's listen. <laughs> Muted, sorry. Great visuals with this one. I love it. 
Um, and this is again what I'm talking about. Like, you know, a lot of what we do as mastering engineers, but also as composers and mix engineers, is we're creating a sonic space. And that space can have certain rules. It can conform to reality or like a, a, an interpretation of reality, or it can exist in totally imagined sonic space. And then you can have fun with it. Imagine if this were um, translated to like an immersive audio format. You could put stuff all around you and have like just crazy movement with those sounds. Um, even as a stereo mix, it's like super fun to hear these things move around and imagine the kind of space you're in. Um, any thoughts listening to this one? Mm, so thinking about the, the kick and the bass, um, it didn't jump out at me too much, but again, so I listened to this yesterday on my good headphones and then like I can't hear very well today I feel very hobbled by earpods I love the earpods for pleasure listening and for checking sometimes I check my work on my earpods but you know I wouldn't work on this um if the kick and the bass were too much that would be something that you could very easily temper with a little EQ just by tucking things in or with a little compression or with a combo with one of those really sophisticated tools, like um, even the ozone dynamic EQ is great at just chilling things out. I feel like I use that phrase a lot in mastering, like chill it out. And that's because sometimes a mix will sound good. And then when you start to turn everything up, everything gets a little too crazy or intense. Yeah, chill it out. Um, do we think this one's too loud for the genre? I, you know, that didn't, it didn't strike me as being too loud for the genre. I think a lot of music in this genre is like pretty intensely loud these days. So it's probably comparable to what you might hear. Again, if this were to land on a playlist, I'm sorry, but that's the way we think about it these days. If this were to land on a playlist of comparable tracks, you would want it to be comparably loud. So, you know, hence, hence the reference tracks. Um, intensity. That's, yeah, I think about that a lot. This is one in mastering that I would think might benefit. You know, I don't know if I have it. I don't know if I have, if I have this plugin over here. Um, yeah, this is one of my favorite plugins. It's called Soothe. It's on sale for Black Friday. <laughs> I gotta, feel like I gotta point that out. Soothe is exactly, it does exactly what you, what it, the title is, right? It soothes things out, it chills things out. I think of this as my chiller outer. So for example, if I were to start playing this, I have no idea what these settings, it's factory default settings, so we'll play around with it. But what you can do is, um, again, it's a really sophisticated way of taking transients and tucking things in. So Okay, that's pretty subtle. I don't think that's gonna translate over Zoom. But when you think about it, like we use a lot of sophisticated tools in mastering. When you think about a tool like this, you can kind of, hopefully the visuals give you a sense of what is happening sonically, but it is taking all those resonances that get a little too intense and just poking them in very, very selectively. You can play around with how selective, you can play around with you know, all of these different parameters um, to dial in the sound here. Like anytime you would use this, you would spend a lot of time really figuring out what you're trying to accomplish with it. I don't just throw tools at it, but this is the kind of tool that mastering engineers use as a chiller outer when things just get a little too intense. Sometimes if I'm getting um, music that was, created with synthetic sounds and mixed in the box. Sometimes this helps uh, shave the edge off some of that intensity or harshness that you might get. Um, this also might be a mix that I would run through the analog chain for the benefit of 
just to be frank about it, $5,000 worth of tubes. You know, like there's a reason that a lot of analog gear is so coveted. It can do pretty magical things to a mix. Then again, sometimes when I'm working with music of this genre, I stay in the box because I want it to maintain that really clean, coherent sound. Um, tell me what other, what other thoughts or questions about this one? It looks like we only have about 15 minutes left. So uh, any remaining things, throw them my way. <clears throat> I, I can show you, I'm gonna pretend something, all right? Okay, look, again, this is visuals and I use this tool all the time so I can interpret the visuals. This is a little bit of distortion right here. You can see these lines. It's, it's just, uh, it's like a tiny bit. It's probably probably inaudible, even for someone with like really well-trained ears. But let's say it's crunches. Let's say that right here, instead of um, being like a nice clean hit, it just goes and it, you hear this like sloppy, crunchy sound. Um, one thing I like to do over here, this is sort of a not necessarily intuitive tool, I use the declicker. Declicker identifies random clicks and pops and attenuates them or removes them altogether. And I use that on distortion sometimes because see, yeah, it just cleans it up. There you go. You can't hear it. You're not going to hear it over Zoom because this is like I use the uh, these monsters for my detail work. Um, but that's the kind of thing I do all the time when you get, sometimes when you turn stuff up, you get a little distortion or crunch if you hit something too hard. This is a nice way to like clean that up. Um, oh, back at the, reading the chat. Soothe on loud music, or it does help with quieter stuff too. You just have to dial it in a little more. You know, it's like however gentle or aggressive you would need to be with it, but it does, I use it on quiet stuff too, especially Sometimes a beautiful acoustic recording will just have a couple notes that resonate a little too intensely because of the space they were recorded in or how the mic was placed and Soothe can help tuck things in. It's, it's just like a nice sophisticated way. In the olden days, we would have like automated an EQ and it would have taken a long time or, or ride the faders if you were doing like an analog mix. Um, some of the tools we work with now are, I'm not gonna say shortcuts because you still have to hear the problem, identify the problem and dial in a potential solution, but they're nice sophisticated ways of uh, fixing things like that. Oh, so for video games, oh, that's a really good question. Um, it's like my first instinct is to say, no, I would just make the music sound the way I think it should sound in any sort of commercial marketplace, but. I haven't done any mastering for video games. So honestly, what I would do is like call up a friend who worked on games and say, hey, what specs do you need for this? How loud should it be? Um, what do we need like an immersive audio format or a stereo or both? So that's kind of where the communication part of this game comes into to play. You know, if I if I don't know what something is destined for or I'm not super familiar, with where it's going, I just have to call someone and ask questions. Um, ooh, okay, here's a, so mastering a Leslie and a B3. Okay, my first thought with that is that sometimes with sustained low end, there's a lot of energy there. It's awesome and it can like make your gut rumble and feel really great, but you really risk distorting because all of that energy builds up and then there's no place for it to go and it crunches. That's my only thought for um, mastering like a B3. I would always be really careful about not hitting anything too hard so I wouldn't risk getting any distortion. And distortion can happen for a lot of reasons. Hitting any one piece of gear too hard might give you distortion and accumulation might give you distortion just making something too loud. You know, there are a lot of 
a lot of pathways to destroying a beautiful recording uh, by hitting any piece of gear too loud. Um, good question about remastered. So it can mean a lot of different things. Sometimes remastered, um, sometimes it means like it came through my studio and I worked from the original tapes and we did this like meticulous remastering and you know, the whole like soup to nuts thing. That's typically the work I do. A lot of times when I'm remastering, the original tapes are long gone and I'm working off the original LP or a cassette or whatever recording exists. Again, it's still my job to make it sound as good as possible, which means if I'm working from an LP, I got to take out all the clicks and pops. Um, occasionally in the commercial music world, remastering can mean uh, an intern ripped a CD and put it up on Spotify and that's a little bit of a cash grab by um, a label or copyright holders. That's just one of the downsides of the industry. But um, in my world, mostly it means we worked from the best source we had, whatever it was, and tried to make it sound both true to the original spirit of the recording, whenever it came from, and like it translates well in today's marketplace. Um, two preamps, uh, that's, you know, I, I love some good, I have some tube gear in my analog chain. I love working with it. It does sometimes present an opportunity for distortion. Sometimes that distortion is really pleasant and we like to hit the gear hard and get that um, crunch, saturation. Uh, sometimes it's unwanted. So again, it's like, it's how you use it and um, how aggressively or delicately you might approach any particular piece of gear. Um, ooh, good question about looping tracks. So yes, this is why I'm always amazed when people want to attend a mastering session because quite frequently I will literally loop, that's nine seconds, I'll loop something really small and listen to it over and over and over because I am getting super analytical. I am listening to all the nuances of all the sounds within that. In this case, I picked the chorus when we were listening to this. Um, often I'm listening to the loudest part, but I may also go back and listen to a really quiet vocal part and just dial that in. But I do, I loop stuff and I listen over and over and over. And I think this was a question earlier. Um, I would say an average time to master one song, if it's just a single, between half an hour and an hour, depending on um, how complex it is or what kind of work it needs. I will do an EP in, you know, I, an EP in a day is a piece of cake. I can usually do a, like a five song EP in under five hours. An album will take me all day. And sometimes if it's a really complex album, you know, it winds up going into day two, like a 10 or 12 song album. Some mastering engineers can work really efficiently and knock that out. Uh, I, I might be a little slow. Or what I like to do is I master it, sleep on it, come back in the next morning and listen for quality control and then make any minor adjustments. We are, uh, we're approaching three o'clock. So before the clock strikes three, any other questions, thoughts? Anything else I can demo real quick? Um, I think there were maybe three. a couple. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I think there were a couple more questions that came in. Did I miss some? Like, uh, oh, or maybe it was just, um, oh, sorry, it was just Justin's. Oh, okay, loudness. Oh, per track rather than, yeah. So I always master track by track. And if I'm doing an album and I want to achieve optimal loudness for the album, I pick the one that feels like the guide. It might be the loudest track. It might also just be the track that feels like the sonic guide. And that becomes my like North star of mastering. And then I make everything else meet that one. Um, it might also be a reference track, but I go, oh yeah, I definitely go track by track. In terms of mixing, 
Um, this is a tricky one because I'll say like in the past year or two, I've, I've gotten some mixes that I was like, wow, you, you gave me like way more headroom than I would have wanted. And the mixes felt really, really quiet to me. So I do think that it's fine to mix to a level of loudness that feels right for you as long as you are not clipping and as long as you leave some headroom for your mastering engineer. But I don't, I don't ever throw numbers at that. Um, I think it's when you're mixing, you know, part of the mix engineer's job is to find that balance. And part of that balance is the loudness. So um, track by track or instrument by instrument, God, the, the, the advice is always like, make it sound good. And that's, that's what we're doing, right? That's the, yeah, at the heart of it. It's just that it's up to you to interpret what good means. Um, balancing vocals and instruments. Um, it's a good question because sometimes a track is very vocal forward and that's the thing that is, that's, that's the thing that takes you through the song. That's the primary focal point of the song. Like, you know, think of Adele's records. Those are vocal records. You're going to hear her voice above anything else. Uh, sometimes I work on something where the voice is much more ingrained in the mix. And I just got one recently. I got um, a client sent me a mix just to check. We're not doing like they're mixing. And he's like, how does this sound? So I was offering feedback and he said, how are the vocal levels? And I said, okay, if you're making a shoegaze record, the vocal levels are good. If you're making a pop record, you need to turn them up like 2 dB. That's another thing where genre comes in. A pop record has vocals very forward. You know, Ariana Grande or Olivia Rodrigo or whatever, like the pop singers of today, vocals very forward. Other genres, they're much more tucked in. So it's, it's genre dependent. It depends on what what is sort of like the thing that takes you through the song? Um, can we play the original? Yeah, okay. So we're, we're back here, right? This is, uh, I'm gonna go over here. If we play this again, this is our mix. And when I put it in input mode and unmute everything except ozone, this will be our attempt at mastering over Zoom. This whole time I've been on my tiptoes Cause God knows what happens next My baby could be me tomorrow that I would dial in more delicately, but that's also part of the process. So sometimes you've got to start with like the general ball, ballpark and then you work on the details. Um, and as far as mastering a completed mix or stems, most of the times I, I get completed mixes. Um, sometimes the completed mix is not working and I ask people to send me stems. Sometimes it's just instrumental and vocal, and then I can dial in the vocal level where it needs to go. Sometimes I get, you know, full four or five stems, and then I essentially am mixing the album. You know, it depends on what the project needs, but I will say definitely by far, I mostly get a two track stereo final mix. Any other questions? This has been such a great group. I love that you are so into it. And you're throwing me so many questions. I really enjoyed listening to the music you're creating, those of you who submitted. Um, wow, I just really want to thank you for inviting me to join yeah. you this afternoon. Thank you so much, Jessica. This is, I mean, I just can't even, yeah, say how much amazing information you have shared with us. So generous. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, everyone who was able to make it and um, great questions, everyone. And I just, um, yeah, I don't know if there's any other <laughs> last things um, we need to say. Uh, Chris, any? No, just last? thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, this was yeah. super fun. I'm actually, when you mentioned the program at the very beginning, I was like, oh, I want to go to school in San Mateo and take this and like take part in this program. And it sounds really fascinating. Uh, 
Well, thank you so much, Jessica. And yeah, thank you everyone again for coming. Um, again, yeah, just so much. I feel like my mind is just, yeah, buzzing with so many great, <laughs> so much great information. <laughs> I know it's a lot. And I know I talk really fast and probably go off into the weeds sometimes. Um, I will say like, I, I, you know, I also teach and I feel really important. Uh, I feel it's like really important to be a, a mentor and to give back to the music community that's given me, me so much. So I always invite you all to stay in touch. Uh, and I will here, I'll put in the chat, you know, whatever you're feeling about social media, this is where you can typically find me on the socials and I'm always happy to connect and stay in touch. Awesome. Well, thank you again, everyone. Yeah, so much for coming.